Sean Haney here with realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. You can hear every weekday on Rural Radio 147 at 4.30 Eastern. Let's talk books. You know I love to read, and I just finished a fantastic book. And luckily, we have the author here. The book is The Mysterious Case of Rudolf Diesel, and the author is Douglas Brunt. Uh, Douglas, great to have you here. Great to be with you. Thanks. Now, as I said to you off air here, I, I really, really found this book uh, fantastic. Encourage everybody to pick it up. Uh, I listened to the audio version, which I really, really enjoyed on a, on a long drive a couple weeks ago. I, I guess let's start off <laughs> the, the title. What is so mysterious about Rudolf Diesel? What, a lot of the reviews are calling it the greatest caper of the 20th century. And it really is this amazing hidden piece of history. As you and I were just saying, you know, we, we know the word diesel. We see it every day at a fueling station or on a tractor or a truck or whatever. And so we know the word, but we often see it misspelled with a lowercase d because we don't know that there was this man, Rudolf Diesel, this German who invented it more than 100 years ago. And the caper piece of it comes in to play because he disappeared mysteriously just before World War I. September 29, 1913, Rudolf Diesel is traveling from Belgium to Great Britain on an overnight passenger ferry. And in the night, while he's crossing the North Sea, he disappears. And so in the morning, he doesn't show for breakfast to meet with his traveling companions at 6 a.m. at breakfast on the ship. So they hold the ship at sea, and they do a search, and all they find are his hat and his coat, neatly folded by the stern of the ship next to the rail, seeming to mark where he may have jumped over. But it was a calm night, so there was no wind, no big waves. It wasn't like he got washed over. And so the, the weird thing about it, I mean, this all ties into what you've been saying, it's hard to describe what a celebrity he was at that time because the history of the man has really been paved over these last hundred years. But when he disappeared, it would be in today's terms like Elon Musk disappearing, like Elon Musk hopped, hopped a flight over to Hawaii and, and then nobody heard from him again and, and the newspapers would go bananas. That's how it was then. It was the cover of the New York Times. It was the cover of the papers in London, all throughout Western Europe and into Russia, wondering about what happened to the great inventor. And while people presumed suicide, people thought, well, maybe he must have just jumped overboard and drowned himself. There were two theories of murder. One was that Kaiser Wilhelm II did it. And the other was that John Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil and the richest man in the world did it. And they each had their motive and a reason why they found themselves in the headlines. For, for the Kaiser, by 1913, the diesel engine had emerged as the only engine that could power a U-boat or a submarine. And this is at the height of militarism and nationalism and the Anglo-German naval arms race. So the navies of every major power are scrambling for diesel power to build a submarine fleet. And it's the only way to do it. And Rudolph really is still the main guy who knows the technology. And the reason he was crossing was he was going to be the co-founder and board director of a new diesel engine manufacturing company to build submarine diesels for the Royal Navy of Great Britain. So you can imagine the Kaiser was thinking, I'm not going to have my German citizen go over and do this. And in, in Rockefeller's case, it was because Rudolph, he, he was an entirely separate threat to Rockefeller because Rudolph advocated the use of different fuels. He advocated the use of vegetable oil or peanut oil for his engine. And he won 13 years before his disappearance in the year 1900, he won the World's Fair in Paris for a diesel engine running peanut oil. It was a totally different kind of engine and had great flexibility with fuels. And he was saying, I can run, he actually in 1912, while he was in America, he said, I can break the American fuel monopoly, and I don't need a law to do it. I don't need the Sherman Antitrust Act. I can do it with the power of my technology. So he represented a threat to both of these figures, and that kind of sets up the mystery of the book. It sort of turns into, as you know, the second half of the book turns into this kind of Sherlock Holmesy whodunit. Yeah, very, very fascinating. I, you know, let's, let's go back to before or kind of as he was working on this invention. He, he grew up in a not exactly a, a, a wealthy family at all, uh, quite, quite poor. They moved around. Um, so he was kind of, he was very familiar with uh, different countries and cultures. What drove him to come up with this really revolutionary invention of the diesel engine? And, and as you document very well in the book, extremely doubted. <laughs> there wasn't yeah. a lot of people saying, this is a great idea, go for it. You're going to be successful. He was really up against a lot of adversity. He was. And what drove him is, is comes from a bit of what you were saying. He came from a very humble background. His father had, and mother had emigrated from Germany to France in 1850. 
And Rudolf Diess was born in Paris in 1858. His father worked with leather goods and was sort of a, a book binder mainly. So they didn't have a lot of money. And they were Germanic in origin. And when, so when the Franco-Prussian War broke out in 1870, which was really all these Germanic tribes like Bavaria, Prussia, others united in war against France, anyone of Germanic descent was basically evicted from the country. So the Diesel family leaves as these refugees and they travel over to London penniless. You know, they kind of had to leave with the shirts on their back because there was looting and rioting in the streets and anybody who was German was, you know, very unwelcome. So they arrive in London and kind of the, the guts of the industrial age, they moved to this neighborhood, which is, you know, incredibly is the same neighborhood that was the setting for Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist. And Rudolph arrives at the age of the title character. He's 12 years old living in his tenement housing where kids his age are being marched into factories instead of going to schools and things like that. And he's witnessing all the ill effects of the industrial age at its worst. And so his hope was to build, he was always sort of very technical minded. And when he was little in Paris, he would go to this technical museum nearby and sketch these old steam engines and things like that. And so he had this idea, and this is documented in their family lore and, and family biographies written by his son, that he had this idea, like, I can build a different kind of engine, a more compact engine that could service rural communities and small businesses. Because at that time, a steam engine would be as big as his father's workshop. But he's like, if I can build a small, compact power source, that could actually power the economies in rural areas and small businesses like my father. So that was the aim. And in the 1880s, he drew up a list of intended users of his engine that would, were, you know, stone, stone carvers and woodworkers and dentists and things like that. So one of the ironies of the book, as you know, is it didn't quite work out that way. Yeah, his intended application, obviously, there's uh, that, that there was some follow through on that, but obviously, <laughs> the the motor vehicle. Uh, then there's the, also the military aspect of this, which I, I'm sure, if you were to look at those original lists, that wouldn't have been really the intention. Not not at all. I mean, he never had envisioned that it'd be a an implement of war. But by 1902, 1903, so he unveils the engine in 1897 after a very trying period of you know building these prototypes for about five years from 92 to 97 97 he unveils it does a ton of licensing deals around the world the, the licensing model at that time was to license the exclusive rights to manufacture and market the engine by national territory and this is where some of the cast of characters in the book gets totally wild because the person who took the rights for north america was adolphus bush who used the diesel engine to power pumping water and refrigeration for his breweries for Anheuser-Busch in America. He also had a separate business building diesels for the United States Navy submarine program. But in, and in Russia, it was the Nobel family uh, related to Alfred Nobel, who had founded the Russian oil industry and other, other things. But by 1902 and 03, the French in particular are starting to put the diesel engine in front of propellers for marine use, and in particular for submarines. And they have early successful experiments with submarine builds, wherein you know prior kerosene, gasoline type engines did not work at all for submarine. The submarine was a joke until diesel came along, and then it became a horrifying offensive weapon that, as we all know, played a huge role in World War One and two. And, and there was there was serious advantages to the diesel engine at that right. So gas powered, explosive, right, mm -hmm. and and steam power taking a lot of time to build itself up to be able to to you know provide that power to the to the train uh, mm -hmm. and and so the diesel really really was kind of uh the best of both worlds i i, I guess in the sense that it really was something very very different different on, on the world scene it was more compact like the small gasoline combustion engines but it could deliver the power and the torque and the high horsepower of a big steam engine but as you say, that steam engine technology was so rudimentary. I mean, it really is like the same idea as boiling a pot of water on a stove. You'd have this huge furnace where you pour in a bunch of coal and you get the fire going. That heats a vat of water to turn into steam and the steam pressure turns the gears of the engine. But if you're in a warship and you need to, you know, suddenly the battle is on, you need to go. It's like, well, everybody runs on the ship. And it's like, all right, well, let's start the fire and let's get the coal going. We got to boil the water. I mean, it takes three, four hours to get out of port because you got to fire up the steam. You got to, as they say, raise steam. The diesel engine starts from a cold start. You just hit go and the engine's pumping and off you go. So that's a huge military advantage for surface ships of war. And of course, submarines, there were, it was non starter. There was no other option for a submarine. And actually, that kind of gets to how I came into the whole thing in the first place because I bought a boat myself like eight years ago. And, you know, having listened to the book, you, you probably know this story. Um, 
I, I bought this old boat and I was going to fix it up. And I'm standing next to the guy at the boat yard. I'm like, what should I do to fix up this boat? And he said, well, for a boat like this, you got to get rid of these gasoline engines and put in diesels. And I, again, I, I kind of thought diesel, I thought of it as a fuel, not a totally different kind of engine. So I said, why? And he said, well, 100% of boat fires come from gasoline engines, none from diesel. Diesel fuel is completely stable, doesn't have fumes. You can drop a lit match into a barrel of diesel fuel. Nothing will happen. And you'll get three, four times the range on your boat. You have 200 gallon fuel tank, you can go three, four times as far. And so I swapped into diesels now understanding it was a totally different thing and then stumbled across this story. Well, and you know, when you look in today's market, like a lot of our audience, you know, we've got 650 horsepower tractors, you know, that are, are, are powered by diesel engines. They're a staple on farms and ranches really across the, the, the world. Um, when we think of inventors, and he mentioned the level of celebrity that he was at the time of his 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 disappearance or his death. When we think about inventors, like if Trivial Pursuit, if you're playing Trivial Pursuit, and there was the you know name a famous inventor, yeah. people are going to say Thomas Edison uh, is an example, or right? Alexander Graham Bell. Mm-hmm. I don't think Rudolf Diesel is at the tip of people's tongues, which is really kind of odd considering. Man, his name is is attached to one of the the greatest power inventions of of the the last hundred years. So why is there that disconnect? <clears throat> this is explained, I think, a little bit in the book. I mean, part of it is that there's this <clears throat> excuse me presumption of suicide, and so I think that has impaired his legacy a little bit. Mm. The other part of it is in the book, and I, I generally don't give away the conclusion of the book, but when you get to the conclusion, you kind of understand why his history has been scrubbed over a little bit. But it, it really is such a shame because, as you say, I would argue it's the number one power source of the last 100 years. I mean, really, one, one quick thing I do to demonstrate that in a, in a short little bit is that imagine a piece of fruit grown in a tropical region. Every piece of heavy machinery and farm equipment used to grow that fruit is diesel powered. It then gets loaded onto a truck. Anything on the roads larger than a passenger car is diesel. It goes down to port where a crane, diesel powered, Loads it, on, loads it onto a cargo ship. And 100% of cargo ships around the world are diesel. It goes across the oceans. It's offloaded onto another truck, onto a train from about the middle 1900s to, to the rest of the century. All trains are diesel powered. So nothing moves in the global economy without diesel. It is the number one power source in the world. And the deficit of appreciation for Rudolph diesel, the man, is unbelievable. We don't even know there was a Rudolph diesel. We know the Wright brothers, we know Edison, Tesla, Marconi, Bell, as you say, nobody knows, almost nobody knows. I I talked to some some, uh, professor the other day, like a science professor, and he knew all all about diesel, but almost nobody knows that there was this this guy behind the engine. Yeah. Uh, Now, um, you you mentioned uh, France with the submarines. He was, he had joint ventures in, in the UK with Churchill. Uh, he had a joint venture in the U.S. He was also doing stuff uh, with some of the the manufacturers in Germany. At at the time here, as we were leading ourselves to World War One, in some ways, like if that was, I, I could imagine social media today. If somebody was, you know, moving all around and working with uh, different countries that particularly were starting to care for each other less and less, and there was growing tension. Uh, how much was he in conflict with himself and the fact he was of German descent? Like, how did all that play into what he was doing on the global stage? He, he was increasingly concerned with nationalism generally, but in particular with nationalism in Germany and their more aggressive foreign policy. <clears throat> At that time, you know, Germany's industry was growing leaps and bounds. And Kaiser Wilhelm felt that in order for Germany to get to the top level, and to fuel the growth, they needed colonies around the world to bring natural resources back into the, and into the homeland. And he felt that in order to have colonies around the world, he needed a strong Navy. So Germany was getting very aggressive with their military spending, particularly for the Navy, and with their foreign policy about acquiring colonies around the world and sort of rubbing up against the colonial interests of other European powers. And Diesel recognized that this was ultimately going to lead to conflict. In his last years, his his patents expired in 1907, 08, and he had a couple lawsuits with the German partners, and he seemed to be spending more time with colleagues in Great Britain and America. Those became sort of closer social friends as well as professional colleagues. 
in those years from 1907 on to 1913. So in fact, in his, in his 1912 trip to America, someone asked him about the German sort of military staff and he sort of compared them to circus clowns and things like that. So he definitely had more acrimony in these last years uh, for people with inside Germany. Uh, as, as you're putting, you know, and, and you, you described uh, when you're looking for a book topic, I, I was listening to you on the Dan, Dan Abrams show on, on POTUS 124 on Sirius. And you talked about how your discovery process of trying to find a topic of just, you know, scouring the internet, looking for interesting people who we don't know a, a lot about. And mm -hmm. I found that to be very, very fascinating. Um, at the end of this process, and you, I don't know how long it took you to to put this book together. I'm sure it was considerable effort and time and commitment to do so. Um, how much more is there to learn about Rudolf Diesel, do you think? Like, you know, there is this kind of a mysterious character, a mysterious disappearance. But at the end of this process that you've gone through, how much more is there to discover, do you think? Well, I'd love to see him get his due and and recognition for his contributions to the last 120 years for <clears throat> for the economy and science. There's not much more to know. It, it's There's still some mystery. And again, for your listeners, I won't give away the whole yeah. thing because I think it, it's fun to sort of unravel uh, as the book lays it out. But there is still a little mystery of exactly the the final ending. Uh, and may, And it may be that one day using this book, someone will be able to leverage into sort of putting that final period at the end of the sentence. Is there a whole... Uh, I, 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 I say the word cult, but I, I don't really mean it that way. But is there, is there like this, uh, have you been hearing from people on both sides of the issue, people that have committed a lot of, you know, hobby time to, mm -hmm. to this topic? We hear about that. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil the ending either. There's, there is a Canadian connection, which I found very, very fascinating as yeah. uh, I myself am a Canadian citizen. So, but it, 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 have you got a lot of feedback on, on the book uh, from both sides of, of the issues? Yes, I have. So, <clears throat> I mean, it's a circumstantial case. He disappeared almost exactly 110 years ago. So all of this is going back. Now, it's actually easier from this perspective to put together a circumstantial case because you can research, even just from like library research, I would call it, to yeah. pull information from your screen <clears throat> of different newspapers. You can put this together. But I put the case in front of former FBI, former CIA, former UK and British intelligence. And they all came back saying a thousand percent, this is what happened. There have been some people who are not totally convinced of the conclusion, but one person challenged it saying, oh, you know, you didn't make enough of his bankruptcy at the end. You know, there's, there's loads of evidence that he was bankrupt. But that, that critique was actually incredibly lazy in its research because while there, there were headlines, and I say this, there were headlines in the weeks after his disappearance saying he was bankrupt. And there are two biographers in the English language, but there's very little written about him in the English language, but two biographers say he was bankrupt. And so someone came back and said, well, you, you did sort of ignored that he was definitely bankrupt and there are loads of evidence for it. But if you go into those biographies and you go back to the notes section, which some people don't go back and actually read all the notes of where their sourcing is, the main biographer who declares most adamantly that it was suicide, when you go back to the notes about his section on why he was bankrupt and all the reasons he was bankrupt, he actually says, it's impossible to reconstruct the bankruptcy. There's zero evidence for it. It's just like that was the newspaper reporting at the time. So some, some people sort of read these biographies and declared, you know, because these biographers said there were stories of bankruptcy, declared that that was the evidence. But if you go back, the, the biographers actually say there is no evidence. So it's just this more murkiness and mysterious, like, why aren't there documents of his bankruptcy? Like, if he had huge debts, why isn't the debt holder out there saying, this is the amount owed to me? No one's been able to reconstruct the theories of the bankruptcy. And so some people have sort of critiqued that piece of it, but it's only further making the point that that the evidence supporting suicide is murky and and not there. Yeah, and, and you don't need to get in the people people need to check out the book and uh, read it, listen to it. Uh, I highly encourage you to do so. Also, you know, you talk about the letter that he had written to his son that seemed odd in the in the weeks mm -hmm. leading up. It, this is a fascinating read. Encourage everybody to check it out. It is the mysterious case of Rudolf Diesel by Douglas Brunt. And and Douglas, I, I really appreciate you joining us and give us in your giving us your time here and uh, talking to the real agriculture audience about this uh, really, really mysterious man 
a great inventor that has created so much value to farming and rural communities. Well, and, and urban people too, but for this audience, uh, definitely uh, it powers a lot of the farm and it has for generations. So really appreciate you diving into it. That's great to be here. Thank you.